Thank you. And so we um, we do want this to be interactive. Please ask your questions in the Q&A box or in the chat, and we will pose them to the panelists uh, later. And um, I want to start with an acknowledgement of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians people, traditional custodians of the land on which the Gardner Institute resides, and pay all respects to their elders past and present. We extend that respect to all indigenous peoples here today. We at the Gardner Institute are still a work in progress. We continue to reach out, read, and speak with experts and members of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians so that our acknowledgement carries with it a commitment to work with the community for change. And with that said, we welcome you and I will turn this over to Dr. Flippin Wynn, who will get us started today. Good afternoon, Dr. Flippin Wynn. Uh, good afternoon, Katie, and thank you very much as uh, as always, it's getting us started. Uh, thank you everybody for being here for the last uh, conversation for the spring. Uh, we ha will have, uh, we may have one in the summer and then we start all over again. So thank you very much for being here. I am not going to say a word. I am going to go straight and just give a list of the wonderful panel and then I'm going to have them uh, give a brief statement. And then we have our amazing student with us today. Uh, Kevin, who we wouldn't uh, want to uh, do this particular panel without having a student aboard. So our guest today, our Chris, Dr. Chris Lavin, he's the Executive Director of Teaching and Learning at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Candace Pozzetta. She is the Associate Professor of English uh, and uh, Director of Development, I believe, at Jackson State University. Uh, Dr. Larry Aker, he is a professor of healthcare management at the Plaster College of Business and Entrepreneurship at Lindenwood University. We have our own Dr. Stephanie Foote, who is a senior associate at the, and vice president for teaching, learning, and evidence-based practices. And she also uh, is a contingent faculty at Stony Brook uh, University. Uh, and uh, we have Kevin McGrill, who is a student and at the Community College of Vermont. So if you want a panel, we got a panel today. And I'm gonna start out with Chris, good afternoon. Please give us a statement, tell us a little about yourself and what's going on at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Colleagues, good afternoon. Dr. Flippin Wynn, I am so grateful for the opportunity to be here amongst my colleagues. I'm here to listen and learn and hopefully share something that might be helpful to others. Um, I'm most readily in my mind, just to make a quick statement, I'm reminded at the end of this academic year, we're getting close to the end of April and into May, about the need for self-compassionate work. Uh, this work is tiresome, uh, this work is important, and this work is key as education is the foundation for uh, everything we do in these college and university settings for our students, through our faculty. But as we go forth with faculty development, it's very important as well as it connects to diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives too, that we self-care for ourselves. Uh, so it's important as we go forward that as we care for others, we're doing that for us because our cars won't go forward without gas. So that's just a thought I had uh, stemming from a committee uh, meeting that we had earlier today. Oh, Monica, you're muted. I was hoping to get through this week without anybody having to say that to me, and it didn't work. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Pizzetta? Hi, yes. Um, I'm, as Monica mentioned, I'm an associate professor of English at Jackson State, but I also um, serve as the director of faculty mentoring, and we, we which, which involves, um, working with all early career faculty, but particularly the first year tenure track um, assistant professors, pairing them with a mentor um, and helping them develop a, a teaching and learning and a research uh, based uh, plan for their, their next four years. And so we really consider that to be essential to sort of meeting the needs of students, making sure that when new faculty come in, 
that we are kind of setting the, the tone for, for what we expect and really, um, you know, letting them kind of bring some energy into their, their own departments. Um, also at Jackson State, just in the last couple of years, you know, the Office of Academic Affairs has started, uh, last year they had a, um, a group led by faculty that looked at our gen ed courses and they're, they're working on a complete gen ed redesign. And part of that involves examining how, um, how the experience of COVID has affected students and student engagement. And so, you know, even though it's, it's not specifically tied to COVID um, or to the pandemic, it, it has kind of come out of, of that experience. Um, so I don't know, um, I don't know how much you want me to say here, but I, I did want to just talk about very briefly um, a couple of things that that we have noticed. So the, the other thing that we've been working on, and, and I'm leading a small group of faculty who last year wrote a strategic plan in preparation, uh, a strategic plan for teaching and learning. So uh, Chris, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about that. Um, <laughs> and uh, we are now this year doing some preliminary implementation of that um, by doing assessments of teaching and learning in our gen ed courses. And that's really the key thing that we want to make sure as we are offering more support to faculty, we are also doing a couple of other things. And one of them is assessment of student learning and getting more student feedback on how they are, um, how they're faring in these um, remote classes, hybrid classes, somewhat online classes. Um, that really is the thing that, that we have seen students struggling with and faculty. Um, you know, even with all of these options that we have, we've recognized that what we've done is taken in-person classes and put them in virtual mode. We haven't really examined thoroughly the methodologies, the pedagogies um, that we're implementing and tried to figure out what we need to do differently to meet the student needs, especially the, the need for connection and engagement, whether it's a synchronous or asynchronous class, high flex, um, hybrid, you know, whatever format it's in. Um, and we've learned from evaluations on our own campus, and, and you can read um, studies out there. There are all kinds of studies that make it clear that students, even though they, they feel like the online environment is okay, um, they don't feel like they're doing well. They feel overwhelmed. There's too much work. Um, they don't feel connected to others. They, um, the, the connection that exists in the classroom just hasn't materialized in the online classroom with any regularity. Of course, you know, some, some professors hit the right note with the right students at the right time, but we, we need some more consistent and continuous um, connection with our students. So just two other things that we, we came up with a list and, and um, I don't want to go into too much detail, but it, it kind of hits on as we are building this teaching and learning um, approach, we want to look at providing continuous support for faculty development in the online format or, or really, I would say in the remote format, because it's not always online. Um, and that is in contrast to what we've seen at our institution and other institutions where faculty are, were trained a little bit for the push in the spring of 2020. And then, you know, there's kind of spotty optional training, but there's not, there's nothing um, really strategic and, and organized about those trainings at most places. It's um, come if you want, uh, but you don't have to. So trying to, to make it more part of the faculty experience. Um, and then making sure that students really know how to access um, these online tools and they're better prepared for online learning. Even though they've been online, many, many times students don't know how to figure things out and that they know how to access um, academic support services. And that's one of the things we're doing this, this spring is studying. We have lots of academic support services, tutoring, so forth, and students, um, just aren't accessing them. And we think it may be because they don't know they're there, they don't know how to access them, or they're not really sure what to expect. Um, and then the final thing I mentioned earlier is embedding quality assessment processes in all of our remote learning spaces um, to make sure that we 
know what's going on in order to support faculty, but also to ensure quality standards. Because we all know when students graduate, they want to get a job. And if their employer looks on their on their transcript and they have all of these online classes, there's still a lot of reticence about online learning um, in the marketplace. So we need to be able to say, we have this online um, learning going on, but we also have quality assurance standards. So our students are learning as much as they would um, in the face-to-face -face classroom. So that that's a laundry list of things we that uh, I hope we get to talk about. Thank you. You are welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Pizzetta. There were a lot of head nods and pencils writing while you were uh, talking. So thank you very much. Dr. Dr. Aker, how are you? I am fine. Thanks for asking, Dr. Flippin' Wynn. How are you? I'm hanging in there and thank you for asking. Tell us a little bit about what's going on with you at Lindenwood, what you've noticed uh, uh, during the pandemic or beyond or any statement you'd like to give to us about uh, teaching and learning or faculty development. Well, whenever I start running too long, do one of these and I'll get the signal. That's right. Um, I've been at uh, Lindenwood University since the end of 2012. And I was originally in our uh, accelerated degree program, who had been around for just about 40 years. And uh, what we did is we taught once a week uh, and we had 12 week semesters. And we basically covered three different classes each uh, of our four hour classes. And we were very strict on uh, how many classes you could miss. Generally, it was one. And what I noticed at some point was that our enrollment in the summer was went down because families want a vacation, go somewhere, and they didn't think that they could miss only one week. So we started with online and it, it did okay. I think occasionally, uh, especially if we brought somebody in, uh, maybe some adjuncts that haven't had a lot of experience with that, uh, sometimes it got crossways and we'd have to to figure that out a bit. But then with the pandemic and all of that, then we basically shut down that program, a whole school there at Lindenwood, and we moved things over to the traditional side of the campus, which at that point had been more oriented towards the traditional college age student. And we did have some pretty good melt of our adult students. They liked coming one night a week, getting credits and, and things like that very quickly. So we have, um, we still have some in-person classes. In my specialty, we're going a little bit away. I hope we come back to that because I think in-person, um, I like that give and take with the students. Uh, and I can tell when they give me one of these uh, that they're not catching what I'm, I'm pitching, if you will. But we have, um, and I think you mentioned it before, uh, Dr. Pacetta, the, the flex. And the flex is pretty straightforward and has been helpful. Uh, you can show up to class. So we'll have, right now I have a 930 class, Tuesdays and Thursdays. First time in 40 some odd years, we're actually pitching this to the younger students uh, before it had been all adults. And students can show up and we have something called the OWL. Um, it basically looks like an owl. It's a uh, camera that tracks you, uh, both as the professor and the audience, and uh, audio as well. So uh, students can come to class, quite frankly, haven't had, uh, haven't had students bust down the door of the classroom. Uh, they can do it, they can do it synchronously, and I have had some students do that, and then asynchronously. Um, we're trying to get them more involved. I don't like to use draconian measures, but sometimes I will give my lecture and I want things that aren't in the book. Please watch the lectures, you know, trying to push them in that direction a little bit. Uh, one of the things that, again, Dr. Pizzetta just talked about, that's why I'm writing notes. Uh, we do have some embedded resources. We have a, a reference librarian. Uh, they have to come up with their sources and the uh, reference librarian helps them find good sources and is part of our Canvas shell. Then I have somebody from our writing center. I, I am afraid sometimes students say, well, if I get a C, that's good enough. And the idea of perfecting their work uh, more, eh, you know, I'm gonna get out with the same piece of paper. Um, 
is with some of these problems are some older adults are having some problems with computers and oh it won't work with uh, respond this lockdown browser and blah 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 um, that is problematic at times and so we have to get them to some support and uh, it is a work in progress well, uh, well said. It is a work in progress, and and that's why we are here today to see if we can't make a uh, make some beginning of some change or some revisions or some thoughts. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Edgar. I appreciate it, Dr. Foot. Hi, Dr. Foot and Wen. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? I'm good. It's always good to see you in another um, place uh, in our meeting. So. Oh, thank uh, you. Go ahead. I know you've got some things that, that you can talk about in reference to what you do with their teaching and learning academy and as a, an instructor. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Flippin Nguyen. And I appreciate the opportunity to be part of this esteemed panel today. And I will keep my comments brief because I know that the audience has a number of questions. So as uh, Dr. Flippin Nguyen mentioned, I do work with our teaching and learning academy at the Gardner Institute. I've been very fortunate over the four plus years that I've been at the Institute to have an opportunity to uh, provide some leadership uh, with the teaching and learning academy. We have over 800 participants now and much like the faculty development work that was going on and the transition that was made during the pandemic, uh, we've really um, evolved in terms of our teaching and learning academy, the design and our offerings. Our um, teaching and learning academy was an in-person activity and it occurred annually as part of our annual conference that we convened on the Gateway Course Experience. And during the pandemic, at the beginning of it, as we were thinking about what we wanted to do, um, our teaching and learning academy fellows and I, we really felt called to create an experience that would be more centered on um, democratizing, bringing to um, faculty of all sorts, backgrounds, types of positions, and also student teaching assistants. Um, and others that are, you know, that care about pedagogy and about teaching students. Um, so we we took our teaching and learning academy and redesigned it completely. And now it, it, it exists um, in synchronous and asynchronous components online still. Um, and that was a transition that we made in March 2020. Although in the future, when we start to come back together for in-person meetings, there may be some in-person components, but we're very excited about that. And we think that the flexible design has really contributed to the participation. And we have all sorts of individuals that are involved again in, in the work. Um, from my own experience as a contingent faculty member, I've been teaching um, online for many years. I taught online even when I was a full-time faculty member and have continued to do that in a, in a part-time role. And I've been involved very much in teaching and learning related research um, and publications. And a lot of it is focused on uh, teaching online and teaching online engagement and effectiveness. And there's a framework uh, that I've been working with, uh, with my colleagues who are doing some similar research on student engagement and in the online learning environment. So these are all things that I'm, I'm very passionate about. But I think in terms of faculty development, what's become so important is that these experiences become more than a workshop. Uh, that was the mistake that we made back in the day. We never referred to it as a workshop, but essentially it was. It was just you know, a day of activities with various uh, breakout sessions that focused on things like inclusive pedagogies and practices or active learning. And now as we've evolved, um, really those, those kinds of, of beliefs, those philosophies undergird what we do and have really helped us again to redesign and to center what we're doing for faculty on humanity and on vitality. So faculty vitality versus productivity and supporting faculty wherever they are in whatever stage of their career or phase of life they're in, but really focused on, on the humans that are, are teaching. And that's very similar to the approach that we've taken, you know, in terms of good teaching. It's really focused on, on the students, centers the students and good faculty development, centers the faculty members and keeps, you know, also very centered the student experience as well. So I'll end with that. And I know you have, we have a student that we want to hear from next, I think. Thanks a lot, Dr. Foote. Uh, and, and Kevin, go ahead. We'd like to, uh, you're the one who, 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 who is the outcome or gets the production of our, uh, what we're doing with our faculty and staff. So talk to us about what you've experienced the last couple of years or what you'd like to see. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Dr. Flip and Nguyen. Um, thank you so much for having me uh, be a part of this panel. Um, 
I just love to highlight that, you know, the importance of this specifically because of all the individuals that a student will interact with within the institution between administration and staff, uh, the faculty is by far who we're going to spend the most of our time interacting with. So having the support for, for your faculty is, is essential to making sure that they have the tools and the energy necessary to give students that time, um, because that's what allows us to thrive. Um, I could talk a little bit about, you know, we seem to be talking about, you know, this shift in the pandemic um, and going into online models. Um, I know, uh, so I go to the Community College of Vermont, and we've actually been doing online since uh, starting in the 90s, even um, just doing email, email lessons. So they, they've been doing online for a while, and they've been doing it pretty well. Um, we're actually working with Vermont State University, which is a new um, entity that's being formulated um, within the state uh, in the um, school merger. Um, and we're looking at how to create um, consistent models for, for our online courses because the feedback that we got from students um, and you know my experience as well, but we're you know in, in pan student panels that we've had within um, the state uh, is that one of the biggest issues that we have with um, these this transition to online is the inconsistency between the classes, which makes it so much harder to find the resources we need to be able to know, you know, um, how to how to reach out to supports if that's necessary. Um, so I think one of the one of the most useful things in this transition that, that uh, an institution can do is support faculty in building these online spaces, um, having templates for whatever you know software that you have that it's easy to just load up and then get trained on quickly so that students don't have to spend that extra time learning, okay, how does this faculty do their assignments and, and where can I find the, the resources for that? So that's probably in, in that realm of, um, of teaching, I think that's probably one of the more uh, useful ways that we can support uh, faculty and students. Um, I'm sure I could go into a lot more stuff. I wrote down some more notes, but I want to be able to get into more of what these wonderful uh, doctors have to say. Um, and if there's questions in the chat, if you guys have anything for me, or if I think of something, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. And, and we appreciate, Kevin, that you always will have something else to add to it. So that's why we ask you time and time again. Thank you so much. I'm going to just go back really quickly to, uh, to Dr. Lavin, because I think he made a really brief statement. Uh, did he, and so I'm going to give him a minute or two to tell us a little bit about what they're actually doing at Knoxville uh, and then uh, ask Katie to open it up for questions. So just a second ago, Dr. Flippin, when I put our unit's annual report, most recent one in the chat, okay. uh, that colleagues links to a document of the work that we have done working uphill for the past, you would say two years, uh, two years and now an extra month because the push started in March, 2020. Um, it's been quite interesting. And I uh, intentionally talked about the self-compassion needed to do this work. Our unit has been through two reorganizations. I've been at UT for six years, so really it's been three. And uh, when March 2020 hit, when this pandemic started, um, we often know in the work of faculty development, working with our faculty, helping our students get to finals, that the work begins to a little bit teeter off, especially at an institution like ours. It focuses then on research uh, because we're a research one university, but not in the summer of 2020. Uh, we begin to work with other units such as the Office of Online Learning and Academic Programs, our Office of Information Technology to quickly develop uh, some strong programs for the summer, such as our virtual ball boot camp, where we helped over 500 faculty uh, to be equipped to teach in this new environment that was steadily coming upon all of us. And then when the fall came, we put up a new program after that called our first year course academy, where we worked with uh, over another 100 faculty, about 133 to be exact, uh, with the 15 uh, highest enrolled courses for our first year students, because we know our students were affected in high school with the changes that happened with COVID. And now they're coming to this big university, oftentimes away from home. How do we help them be successful? How do we keep the retention rate high and grow it in the midst of such turmoil and change? Um, once we sat down with a new reorg and kind of uh, got a lay of the land again, 
our focus was really holistically on the overall success of our faculty. So our unit has existed on the campus since roughly the 1960s. Historically, it's been about teaching and learning. That's our bread and butter. But under our new Vice Provost for Faculty Affairs, Dr. Diane Kelly, we begin to take a more holistic look um, at the campus, but also at other institutions, surveying about 40 to 45 similar institutions to us to revamp our mission, our vision, our vision, excuse me, and our values uh, so that we could be in alignment and equipped to do the work uh, up until this point. Uh, so a couple of great things came from that. Uh, we were already the institution's home of quality enhancement plan, our QEP, that's a, a mandate from SACS. Uh, many institutions from roughly uh, the Northeast down to Texas, no SACS. And so we were finishing up our impact report, which we passed successfully with no issues. Our uh, QEP was on experiential learning housed here in teaching and learning innovation. But we realized, and I think uh, Dr. Pizzetta mentioned it as well as Dr. Acker, we have to go where the faculty are. And many of our faculty were working from home, working off campus, not in their offices. So we began to create new programs, such as an asynchronous certificate program for experiential learning, another one for inclusive teaching that was so successful that, for example, our law dean, uh, dean of the law school, uh, guided all of his faculty to take it. And they were supported financially to do so. We created two or three other certificates, one on positive psychology, one now focused on the volunteer experience, which is somewhat related to our uh, gen ed, our new gen ed, uh, which is also titled the same. Dr. Foote mentioned that. Um, and we begin to shift gears with our conference. So we just started under the leadership of our director of professional development, Dr. Ferlin McGaskey, a great colleague. Uh, we developed uh, an innovative teaching and learning conference that we launched in 2019 in person to about 150 colleagues just roughly here in the state and the region. In 2020, we were about to launch this conference for the second time. COVID stopped it, so we had to adjust. And in 2021, we brought it back virtually and we reached colleagues all across the country. Um, close to, uh, I'll say over 300 colleagues joined. And and just a month ago in March, we did it again. Um, and we had over five or about 475. I don't wanna inflate the numbers, but why I say that is because this synchronous and asynchronous work. We also worked hard to highlight success stories from our faculty and those teaching off campus with experiential learning. How do we equip them to be safe during the pandemic? So we've been working tirelessly to meet the needs and I'm gonna add this, and I don't mean it in a harmful way, but it is part of the reality. Several states are adopting legislation in the state of Tennessee, the divisive concepts is what it's phrased as, has also been something we've had to keep an eye on to support our faculty. Um, this work is very important. It's integral to the lifeblood of the campus. We're all here to educate. Uh, yes, we know our academics, uh, many of our faculty and, and our students in particular, our student athletes, our faculty are working with them to ensure they meet their educational goals too. But at the heart, at the center of it, it's about education. And so we've had to keep our eye on all of these challenges. Um, and I'll have to mention, our chancellor used to say it um, when we're in the heat of all of this, um, it's not just the COVID pandemic, it's the social justice and racial pandemic. Excuse the phone in the background, but I think about George Floyd and several of these other issues that we've also had to tackle in the midst of doing the work. And so to tie it all together, that's why I start with self-compassion because it's a weary work. Mm -hmm. It's a beneficial work. It's a work that's necessary and needed, but it's also a work, as I often tell our team, you gotta check your temperature every day because each day brings challenges and we have to make sure we're mentally, emotionally, and physically prepared to be effective. Okay, uh, thank you so very much. Uh, I knew we were gonna need longer than our regular hour for this amazing panel, uh, but we're gonna go ahead and um, uh, take a moment and uh, get some questions, uh, hopefully around what we've had our panelists talk about today. So Katie, it looks like I don't need to ask you that. You've got several already. 
Indeed, I do. So the first question was um, specifically addressed to Dr. Aker. What are the technical resources needed for the flex courses at Lindenwood University? Hmm. I'm not the only one. You're on mute. You're still on mute. I can't go a week without doing this either. Uh, <laughs> so let me rephrase. I'm just trying to enlarge my time here. Uh, you need a camera that works. Owl is OK, uh, but you can't write it on the board and see it very well. Uh, it gives you a general feeling of being in the classroom. So we have a, uh, a tablet that we could actually draw on. We can bring up our PowerPoint slides, uh, YouTube videos, whatever we have. So you need that. And we do have online uh, experts, if you will, that will help us design the classes. Um, there is occasionally some uh, rub on that because maybe the school wants something this way and the online designers want something that way. So as faculty, sometimes we have to uh, navigate that uh, crisscross. Katie? Thank you, Dr. Hager. Yeah. Um, what has research shown about the effectiveness of synchronous virtual classes when compared to asynchronous online classes? I'm teaching three virtual classes and find that students enjoy them and that they are very helpful for students with jobs, transportation, or child care issues. I think all three, uh, well, all of our uh, guests can comment on that and our student, but please keep it to a minute. Uh, so we can get everybody in. Uh, Dr. Levin, we'll start with you. Katie, say it for us once more. Sure. What has research shown about the effectiveness of synchronous virtual classes when compared to asynchronous online classes? That's a great question. So I'll mention a couple of things and I wanna be completely transparent. Often the research I've read talks about uh, similar effectiveness with in-person and online courses. I've not, uh, and that's not part of our unit's charge, um, delved deep into synchronous versus asynchronous as much as have observed and worked with faculty on our campus. That said, as part of the past couple of years, one of the things that we have heard and seen at times is the difference in experience for students uh, when it comes to the synchronous versus asynchronous. Uh, we've often relied on our colleagues in the Office of Information Technology and the Office of Online Learning and Academic Programs who serve as our campus experts. But when our faculty come to us and we talk, talk through these problems, these issues with them alongside those other colleagues that I just mentioned, we often guide them to think through a couple of things. One is, the authenticity of the learning experience. Are you stating learning objectives, whether it be um, in person or online? Are you using We Are Canvas Institution? So making it clear what you want from your students, what you want your students to learn, and taking into consideration, especially colleagues, and I'm not sure your experience with this, but uh, that 2020 21 year um, was tough because our students. Many of them were off campus, not always on, and when they're at home and they're using things like Zoom to uh, join in for the synchronous or if it's an asynchronous course and they are in a rural part of Tennessee, that cell phone connection, that Wi-Fi connection isn't as strong as if they would have been on campus. So we have to constantly consider their geographic placement to be able to even connect and participate and to be effective. We heard stories of students having to go to the local quote unquote McDonald's, Burger King, uh, sitting in the car trying to connect, not being able to do it during the day, having to uh, be mindful of deadlines, they're uh, working or they're trying to take care of a sick parent or family member, juggling a lot. Uh, another issue that would sometimes come up is the equity in showing themselves on the screen. Uh, because of what might be going on in the background um, of their homes or wherever they are located. 
um, it was tough uh, going through this. And so those are things, kind of the social aspects uh, that would often come up in, in our conversations. Um, of course, now all of our students are back and have been back. Uh, so we aren't dealing with those things as much, uh, but there's still an investment in, in growing those types of learning experiences online for our students, uh, not just here on the campus, but across the state of Tennessee as we are the land grant flagship, uh, but also wanting to do so beyond that nationally and internationally. Uh, so as I think back in reflection, those are just a few thoughts that come to mind. We have to think about our students, where they are, uh, geographically and emotionally and personally to receive the learning from these courses, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, so that they can uh, move forward and be successful. Thank you uh, very much. Did any of our other panelists want to make a statement or uh, on this or uh, our student want to respond? I mean, I can speak uh, anecdotally. I don't know the research on this. Um, but uh, from what I've heard from other students and what I've experienced, um, asynchronous is definitely more convenient in many ways, um, unless you have those connectivity issues. Um, uh, but I've always found syn synchronous and in-person classes just be way more engaging. Um, and also, I think in a way, the how we use our energy trying to like navigate, you know, uh, a purely online asynchronous course, um, there's a lot of extra energy that goes into that. And the model that we have for it sometimes feels like it ends up being more work, you know, they have to still get those participation, you know, marks. So they have, you know, at least the way that we do it through we have canvas, um, we do discussion boards and stuff like that. But there's, there tends to be more disjointed, smaller assignments that you kind of have to get put out, um, at least in the, the ones that I've taken. Um, whereas, you know, uh, at least the community college, we do one class a week, and you go in, you sit in there for three hours, you're getting a, like a lot of that credit hour that you're, you know, signed up for is being taken care of in person, you're there, you have that structure, you have that back and forth. Um, so in ways, um, I, I've always found those classes to be easier on my bandwidth. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Anyone else? Um, I just wanted to say very quickly that um, there, there is some research out there and the interesting thing about it, and, and I, I think I would recommend, I think it's called Frontiers in Education, um, that they've done, they published some studies. But the interesting thing is, um, it's kind of what Kevin was talking about. It depends on what the student wants, that the students don't perceive that their learning is significantly different just based on the, the mode of delivery. What they do feel um, is more, is a little different is the, the level of work required of them. So in the asynchronous class, you know, they have to, read everything, watch everything, figure it out, or send an email and wait for the email to come back. Whereas in the synchronous class, it's it's very similar in most cases to the face-to-face -face class. Now, some people still learn better the other way, but, um, it, and that was really, I was, I was convinced that it, synchronous must be better, but um, the research is much less clear about that. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, Katie. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yes. Um, so in reference to a statement in the chat, how do we balance the need to use a template for student ease of access and the need for the instructor to stay true to best practices in pedagogy? Okay. Dr. Erica? And now I got it turned on. Uh, used to have a professor that liked NASCAR and he would talk about rubbing the paint between two cars. And we do get some running the paint uh, with somebody who maybe is a great builder of, of uh, these canvas shells, for example, uh, but hasn't taught. And then we get the people that think they know everything and don't wanna try something new. Um, I think that's going to be um, an always happening thing. Uh, as a school, uh, what I'm in, uh, Plaster uh, School of Business and Entrepreneurship, 
uh, we do actively engage Lindenwood online so we could say, eh, that's not really working for us. Uh, one simple example is they had this wonderful landing page. Uh, you could poke different things and it would go different places, but our students weren't looking at the modules and the modules is where they get their information from. So, you know, we said, all right, we'll put that in to begin with, but on week three, it's going away. We're going to do it this way. And um, so, yeah, there's always going to be some, some tension that way, um, but generally it'll work out. Okay. Dr. Thank you, Dr. Flip and Wynn. So I think it, from my perspective, both as an instructor and as somebody who's done some instructional design and faculty development, there are things that definitely we can do to design courses, whether they meet predominantly, you know, in person or online, synchronous or asynchronous, to help students understand better the navigation of the course and how to be successful in the class. One of the things that I do personally and that um, now other colleagues have started to do as well um, is to use TILT, so use transparency in learning and teaching, use those principles to communicate clearly the purpose, task, and criteria for success uh, for all of the assignments and activities in my course. So regardless of the modality, I can share with students using a common template. I use purpose, task, and criteria for success as a common template to organize all of the assignments and activities. So as I'm going through the exercise of planning the courses that I teach, I'm do using this and communicating clearly to students what I'm expecting from them, what they can expect from me, and then how they'll be evaluated. I think that things like that, we can all agree, you know, are very good from a structural perspective but really don't impede on our, our pedagogy necessarily. Um, and if they did, it would only be to make it better. I think <laughs> we can all do a better job when we understand you know, clearly what these, these things are and how to communicate them to students. I think from a design perspective, one of the things too that I, I think is so important um, in achieving the balance is to find ways that we can humanize our courses and our disciplines. And one of the first things that I do in my courses, again, regardless of mode, modality, um, is to create a liquid syllabus. Um, and in the liquid syllabus, you know, I'm presenting to the students the things in the syllabus, which are oftentimes not exciting and stimulating, you know, some of the policies, practices, but also assignments, activities, expectations uh, that are more important and then sharing with them resources. So bringing those things to life uh, by putting them in very lay terms, you know, common language, accessible language, adding resources, information, examples, things that are a little bit more robust uh, than I would be able to within the learning management system to present in like a, you know, module zero start here, you know, within Blackboard or, or desire to learn. I also include in it um, in the liquid syllabus um, I include in it an introduction, I include additional resources, which I just mentioned, um, because I teach in a graduate program for um, students who are going into higher education, so they might be going into administration or the professoriate, and I teach um, largely student development theory and some of the other required courses that they take in the first year. They have to know APA format or be able to use APA citations, and so I've created a lot of resources, wakelets, and things that I link to in the in the liquid syllabus, and I find that to be very effective. So that's a way that I can clearly communicate to students how to navigate and what to expect uh, within the course, and at the same time, I can humanize and and show them how I will approach the the course pedagogy, the structure. Uh, the teaching approaches that I'll use. And then there is a question I think about, and I know you'll get to it next, about underserved students and supporting them. And I think this is also, for me, it's illustrative of the commitment that I have to designing a course that's accessible for all students, you know, whether they're historically marginalized or if they're from the majority, where, wherever they're accessing the information. The liquid syllabus that I just described that I've committed to and have been doing for the last several semesters is designed in um, Google Sites so students can access it on their phone um, or a tablet or other device. Um, and it's, it's linked in our learning management system, but they have access to it before the class starts. So there are particular dates you know, that the course has become available, but to make sure my students are prepared for when the class begins and they have lots of background information if they want it, and it's all in an accessible format 
um, I, I use that approach again to make sure that I'm ensuring accessibility. And at the same time, I also link to a, a short uh, beginning of term survey where I'm asking students a little bit about themselves and about their perceptions of the course, how they'll access the course, what uh, they expect, what they want from me, what they don't want from me. And all of those micro data I then use, you know, as I'm determining, you know, final changes and course pedagogy and structure. So those are just some of the things that I do. I don't know if I've answered the question sufficiently, but <laughs> maybe I've wrapped up a couple of answers um, in that response. But those are just some of the things that I do to kind of balance out having some consistency and still preserving pedagogy and, and my personality in the courses that I teach and also making sure that everything I'm doing is accessible. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Foote. Uh, and if you didn't answer it, you gave us so much more. So that's perfect. Uh, Katie, we want to uh, ask all of our uh, guests the question in reference to uh, historically resilient or underserved populations. Can you give us that one? Yes, of course. Um, so the question is, how are underserved students who need it supported in online courses as they might have additional challenges? Um, Dr. Pizzetta, can we start with you and then go to uh, Dr. Levin and then Dr. Uh, Aker and then Kevin and then Foot? Yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, one of the challenges that many students have is that they don't have a reliable laptop. Um, they, they do things on their phone. Um, so our university, what they have done is, you know, boost the, um, the internet uh, bandwidth because we suddenly had instead of you know a few hundred students on campus at the same time on online on the wi-fi we suddenly had two thousand students um, who were on campus all day on the wi-fi um, we've also tried to find ways to make uh, laptops available to students um, you know some of it has been kind of touch and go. Uh, I think one of the challenges during the pandemic was getting laptops because everyone suddenly wanted a laptop and a and a camera. Um, so we've we've worked through some of that, but but the primary thing, you know, outside of the technology is um, what Dr. Lavin was talking about earlier about being um, being sensitive to the student needs, kind of being being human. Um, and humane and um, you know, making sure that all of our policies within, within departments and within colleges um, allow students some flexibility. So if they do have difficulties, they don't have to jump through a lot of hoops to prove that, that we, you know, we show them some grace, um, not just when they have COVID, but when they have technology issues. So um, I think that's really the key. It's, it's not, you know, there, there are some things we can do on the technology end, but, but primarily it's understanding that not all of your students come into the classroom with the same kind of access or the same kind of experience with it with the online technology. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Levin. I fully agree with Dr. Pizzetta. I wanna take it a step further. One of the things we've talked with faculty about in recent months is deficit-minded thinking. And I think it starts with an awareness of self and realizing sometimes just in the go and flow of semester after semester, the language we use with our students, we can sometimes get laxed and forget. And so when we talk about our students who come from underserved backgrounds, in person or online, and I think online is even more critical because so often, we post words and statements that they read and see time and time again uh, that frames them in a certain way uh, that isn't necessarily um, you know, the, the, the truth for them. And it's not always meant to be harmful or negative, of course not, but uh, we can sometimes get into this biased way of thinking um, in translating and sharing what we want them to know in a way that kind of uh, puts them in the back seat instead of in the driver's seat. So we've often talked with our faculty about a couple of ways to kind of uh, combat this. Uh, we, we've talked about Siegelman's theory uh, around positive psychology and PERMA, and I can put a couple of links to that in the chat in just a moment. Uh, we've also talked about a learner-centered syllabus. Um, how can we get away from just the black and white piece of paper 
uh, make it a little bit more illustrative, organized, clear to understand, and also uh, putting in uh, some actionable items. Uh, not long ago, there was an article from a professor and I'm gonna talk about a, a, a system member institution for a moment. He was at UT Chattanooga and he hid $50 in a locker. And if you read through the syllabus, you knew exactly where that $50 was in that unlocked locker um, and no one would find it. Um, and so it's just finding fun ways to uh, make sure our students understand the syllabus is the foundation of the course. You want to do well, read the syllabus well, uh, make the syllabus active and engaging for the student to read so that they can learn why it's important. And the other thing I think about is anytime we can engage students together so that they are codependent so that they are peers walking through the learning opportunities together, the learning journey of each semester in the course, whether that be through group work, uh, whether that be through uh, some type of uh, check and balance where you complete and so you will grade mine and I will grade yours so that those relationships can be established. Um, I think part of the joy of learning is learning together. And so we often uh, provide faculty with uh, resources and advice around active and engaged learning. We don't have time to get into experiential learning uh, because that's a whole nother layer of this. And that's possible in online courses too, but those are just some initial thoughts. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And please uh, add those links to the, uh, uh, to the chat for us. Dr. Aker. Well, we do have loaners, uh, laptops. They do have to put down a little bit of deposit and of course we have uh, computer labs to help students that run into problems. One of the things I like to do is kind of experiment on low stakes uh, things early in the course. So if a student doesn't have a lot of money, maybe they got a fairly inexpensive uh, computer that doesn't work with our learning management system. Well, let's find that out before you lose 150 points on the final. Uh, how can we work around this? What's What kinds of things that can we do? What are you not understanding on the low stakes that you'll need to understand on the high stakes? And we also build in, um, you know, for papers, which I'm a, I'm a bug on, uh, you know, give me a topic. Give me a thesis statement, give me, you know, an outline, all those kinds of things, spread that out over our eight week courses so we could kind of, uh, for those students that need more direction and assistance, we can address that. I have some students that just go off on their own and do a great job. Others do panic a bit, and sometimes you actually need to call students and say, how can I help? What's going on? Okay. Okay. We're back at the time. Uh, we have got more questions than uh, a little bit, but what we would like to do is, first of all, uh, I'm already asking you back next semester. So, uh, you know, that's it. I'm, I'm, we're gonna have a fall one because this is, uh, this is key. But most importantly, I'd like you to take 45 seconds, this in, includes Kevin, and to give us a, 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 just an ending remark that you want us to know or what you want to put out there, what you want your colleagues to know uh, before we end. So teaching and learning development, uh, uh, 45 seconds so everybody can get in. And we'll start with Dr. Foote. Thank you, Dr. Philip and Wynn. It almost took me the whole 45 seconds to find the unmute button. <laughs> I was so engaged in what everyone's saying. I think for our last thoughts, um, I would just reiterate some of what's been shared today. You know, I've been so inspired by what I've heard from my colleagues on this panel, as I imagined I would be. Um, you know, Dr. Lavin started us off by talking about the need for self-compassion. And he also talked about the authenticity of the learning experience and creating these authentic learning experiences. And as I think about our future as faculty members or faculty developers or students, you know, in, in these courses that are being taught, that this really has to be the focus. We have to create experiences for our students and faculty that allow for self-compassion, that uh, provide support and meet the faculty members and the students where they're at. They have to be just in time, they have to be meaningful, and they have to be real. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Aker? I've always used the analogy that you need multiple arrows in your quiver. Um, coming from the land of andragogy, uh, one arrow won't 
hit everything. And so you have to watch your students have to be somewhat uh, flexible. And I have, I've been teaching since 1984, probably before some folks were born, but uh, I have never taught the same class the same way twice. Uh, I always look, I said, where did I screw up? Where did they, you know, have trouble with? And it, again, it is a growing process. Um, and each time you make it better. So it, that's what I think. Thank you very much. Dr. Pizzetta. I think it was uh, Dr. Foote who used the term faculty vitality. Um, and, and I think that's really at the key of what we have to do with faculty is, is look at them um, as people who have um, you know, complete selves, complete lives. And when they engage with us and talk about um, their course development or, or whatever their needs are, that we help them see that this is a way to, to enrich their lives and you know, make it an enjoyable experience. Um, I love that Dr. Aker was talking about never teaching the same class the same way twice, because that means you're excited about it. And if you can get faculty excited about it and encourage them, then you know, it doesn't matter what tools you're using, you're going to have a much better result. Okay, thank you very much, Kevin. Boy, um, yeah, I would say that I probably would want to actually highlight um, something Dr. Pizzetta said about um, embedding, you know, the quality assessment um, resources, because, you know, a lot of, I know at our institution, we don't really, there's still data that we just don't have, or we don't really know how do we measure outcomes for asynchronous versus synchronous, and I think um, a key part of that, especially because this is so new. I mean, we're in just in the early years of really understanding how um, education is going to evolve. Um, and I think there's really a lot of potential here to make it more accessible to so many more people. Um, but we need to get actual real data on this. Um, so finding those ways to uh, uh, embed those those um, uh, assessment tools into your classes is going to be really important. Um, and then also communication is another area that I know um, CCV has trouble with um, reaching out to faculty to even let them know that these things are available and making sure that students know that the resource is available. It's a constant, um, you know, a constant effort to figure out what's effective. And I, I just think we need to be persistent in this. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm excited for the direction that everything is headed. And thank you for having me here. No, thank you for being here. And Dr. Uh, Levin, take us home. I want to start with the words that our chancellor often shared with us in summer 2020. She often encouraged us to be creative, to be flexible, and to be compassionate. And I think this teaching and learning work, this research work, this education work that we do, at the heart of it, it's about people. And we cannot forget colleagues, not just for ourselves, and for those around us, staff and faculty, but especially for our students, everyone is carrying something we can't see. And so in order to reach their full potential, help them and ignite their passion, we have to uh, make sure that we keep in, in, the, in the front of our minds, we are constantly working with people, people who are passionate, people who are powerful and people who can change the world, but they need us at our best selves uh, to be there for them, to support them, to listen to them um, as we all work through this work uh, to do the best that we can each day. Um, and in order to do that, again, I say, because I think it's important enough to repeat, uh, we've got to make sure we have the fuel in our tanks to keep going because this is a marathon and certainly not a sprint. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to, and thank you, Dr. Lavin, I want to thank all of my guests uh, for uh, this amazing panel, uh, giving us something to think of. And thank you for bringing your best selves uh, this afternoon. I want to thank uh, Katie, Ethan, and Rob uh, for this spring session. Uh, we will be sending out the uh, announcement, uh, excuse me, the recording uh, for everyone and for those who weren't able to make it. You also will get an evaluation. Please let us know what we need to do, what else you'd like to see uh, as we move into another uh, session of the Transformative Conversations. It's been our honor uh, and our privilege to be with you for the last several months. Please stay safe and we hope to see you soon.
Take care, everybody, and thank you so very much. Bye-bye.